Hi everybody, hope you're having a good summer despite COVID-19. We're probably going off to camping to Keswick next week with the tent to see the convention, but since that's not going to happen, we've put the tent up in the garden and we're having our own version of the Keswick convention here. We've really enjoyed going to Keswick over the years with our children and we've always found it helpful and encouraging and challenging. And we'd really like for our church family to see what it is that we're so enthused about. We want to encourage you to watch this coming week. Bye. Bye. Good morning everybody, welcome to our morning service for the 26th of July. I expect that by now you're fed up of hearing me talk about the Keswick Convention online, uh, but do make the most of it. It is this coming week and it is an opportunity not to be missed. Also uh, this week, uh, our own uh, Robert Bashford has had a book published. You can see it over in that corner there. It's a book on Handel's Messiah and uh, the story uh, of the Messiah and how uh, the Bible passages were put together and what they're all about. Uh, if you want to get a copy of that, and it really would make excellent August holiday reading, get hold of a copy. Um, you can contact Robert or there are details on the CFN which you will find on our blog site blog.stbots.church you find all the details of how to get hold of that book there well that's the notices out of the way 
let's be quiet for a moment, shall we, as we prepare to worship God together. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray together as our Saviour Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The Bible reminds us that if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The uh, Collect for today, the seventh Sunday after Trinity. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of your great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Now it's time to go over and see uh, what Jonah has been up to this week. Hello again, everybody. I hope you're all okay. Oh, hello, everyone. Oh, I hope you've had a good week. Now today, Jonah and I thought we would pop down to church to tell you about a story that Jesus told people. And that was a story about two people, someone who was proud and someone who was humble. And they went to their temple to pray. Would you like to come with us? See you there. See you there! So last week we were thinking about how God can change us to be more like Jesus if we ask him. And we learned how Zacchaeus completely changed when he met Jesus. And he realised how much Jesus loved him. No one liked Zacchaeus very much because he was a tax collector 
uh, and he stole people's money. At least that was until Jesus called him down from the tree and Zacchaeus changed. That's right. People didn't like tax collectors very much at all. But Jesus loved them just like he loved everyone else. In fact, Jesus knew that people were grumbling about how he had gone to Zacchaeus's house and he told them that his purpose for coming to earth was to seek and to save the lost, like Zacchaeus. Yeah, Jesus didn't just mean tax collectors though, did he? He meant everyone, because Everyone needs to be saved by Jesus. But to be saved, you have to understand that you need to be saved and that Jesus is the only one who can save us. The Bible calls this repentance. That's right, Jonah, it does. It also means putting Jesus and other people before yourself and sometimes that's difficult but it's also called being humble. Jesus told a story about someone who was proud and someone who was humble. Shall we watch a video about it Jonah? Oh yes please that would be really good. Bye everyone, bye. Bye everybody. Stories of the Bible the Parable of the Pharisee and Tax Collector. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like walking on water. Oh, hey guys and even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! One day, Jesus told this story to some people who thought they were very good and looked down on everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, <laughs> and the other was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated by many people. Yeah. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not bad like other people, cheaters and sinners. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Ha <laughs> ha. I fast and give up eating food twice a week, and I give you a tenth of everything I earn. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest because he was so sad, saying, God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Then Jesus said, I tell you, when the tax collector went home, he was right with God. But the Pharisee was not right with God. Everyone who makes himself great will be made humble, but everyone who makes himself humble will be made great. I am part of something beautiful Placed by you with care among them all Every piece unique and different Your love shining through You're the artist, we're the image Made to be like you I want to know who I am so I'll listen to you you are God and you tell me what's true I want to see who I'll be when you're working in me You made us to show your glory I am known by some 
someone perfectly On your mind before I came to be I don't even know myself as well as you know me When I live as you have made me To know who I am So I'll listen to you You are God And you tell me what's true I want to see who I'll be When you're working in me You made us To show your glory We are made for even greater things Made to share the life that Jesus brings Peace that never can be broken Living with our friends We're accepted and forgiven Loved without How are you doing Cynthia it's really lovely to see you how are you I'm fine thank you Kirsty love to see you too ah oh, thank you um I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions um okay. about how lockdown has been for you first of all what's it been like in the Cynthia household mm, well obviously at the very beginning Erica just had his knee operation which went very well so initially uh we were just in a little cocoon here looking after him making sure everything was well. I was busy, 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 looking after him, doing all the exercises with him, because all my outside business had stopped. Everything I used to do had obviously disappeared like most people. And so we were just in our own little bubble initially. Uh, everything was fine um, because uh, Eric couldn't drive or go anywhere for about six weeks anyway. Yeah. So and then, and then what, happened, what happened after things settled down with Eric? Because I know he's... he's out playing golf and things now isn't he that's right yes so um then i sort of dawned on me that um all my business had gone and it was just i was just myself i wasn't particularly going anywhere at that stage we weren't really able to talk to people so much um and i found that my emotions suddenly became to the front i was jealous of people who were able to meet up with grandchildren um i really wanted to do things that i couldn't do um, I didn't mind doing what we were doing because obviously to stay safe, but I was quite surprised at how I was actually feeling and it was as if I'd gone right back to just being me, no outside influences. Obviously Eric was good and we were getting on fine and contacting everybody by Zoom, but um, I think God was obviously then trying to say, look, um, I've been looking after you. Um, would you like to join me a little bit more often? Because through the St. Bottles um, site and Refresh site, I was getting more involved with people and praying for them. And that just led me into, well, it's been lovely. I've spent more time with the Bible, reading tracts, talking to neighbors, giving them books, um, gradually feeling more relaxed, more peaceful. And as things are changing in the outside world, we're able soon to meet up more with the grandchildren and so God has definitely been caring for us so I'd already 
grown up in a Christian family and I felt as I've tried to live a Christian life, probably hadn't spoken to people about my Christian faith before, but during lockdown, because I was stripped right back to just me and no extra busyness and the world, um, I feel a lot more connected with, uh, with God and the works of Jesus. And for that, I'm truly grateful and just feel as I'm surrounded a lot by his love. Cynthia, that's so helpful. And I think a lot of what you were saying was probably what a lot of us are feeling in terms of those having to face our emotions. Mm. Um, and it's amazing to see how God has used that time to speak to you and continue to Definitely. do his work in your heart mm, yes. and that's so totally exciting truly grateful. And because i felt as though some people are learning spanish or learning how to play chess or knitting things and and i just felt as though i hadn't created a new skill but in actual fact i feel as i've really become a different person the and same person but slightly different <laughs> and that's brilliant isn't it and we we can praise god for that um Cynthia, Absolutely. thank you so much for sharing what you've been going through um and we look forward to giving you a big hug when we get to see you soon Ooh, absolutely thank you kirsty thank take you. care and God send bless. our love to eric as well won't you will do thank right. you thank bye you. then let's pray almighty god our heavenly father you promise through your son jesus christ to hear us when we pray in faith as countries throughout the world struggle to prevent loss of life due to COVID-19, we pray to you for your mercy and for effective arrangements that will prevent further suffering. Lord, we know that you love all your people throughout the world and that the virus has more impact on some than on others. So we pray that in your grace and mercy, you will heal those who are ill, sustain and strengthen those who are caring for them Give wisdom to all those who are working to produce an effective vaccine and to leaders who must plan for how to best prevent further loss of life. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support those who are anxious and lift up all who are brought low that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. We also raise to you the continuing situation relating to people fleeing persecution and suffering in their own countries and travelling to other countries, including Britain. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all goodness, generosity and love. We thank you for opening the hearts of many to those who are fleeing for their lives. Help this community to open its arms in welcome and reach out our hands in support, that the desperate may find new hope and that lives torn apart should be restored. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who fled persecution at his birth and at his last triumphed over death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on your church throughout the world. Thank you for giving us your word in the Bible, that we may know you and your plans for us. Thank you that your church is beautiful to you, as a bride is to the bridegroom. Please help us to please you by telling others the good news about your death and resurrection. Give us your Give your blessing to all who have dedicated their lives to teaching your holy word, including our friends in other countries who have left their homes and families to do this. Lord God, please bless us in all the activities in this church. We ask that as we prepare to meet together once more, you will bless all our plans, keep us safe, and enable us to extend a warm and clear message to all that everything is under your control and that the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus endures and sustains us throughout everything. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we raise to you our families and friends. At this time, 
we pray for your comfort of all those who are sick and those who care for them, for those who are anxious, for those who lack the resources we all need, and for those who grieve. Please give us all more compassion for each other, a clear sight into spoken and unspoken needs, and imagination in the way that we could help others in your name. Please bless Mark and others as they minister to those who grieve. Bless those who need your comfort. We now name them aloud or in the silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we pray for ourselves. Give us grace to remain patient through times of trial, remembering the significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus, presenting ourselves as salt and light in this community each day. Please help us to keep the good news central and first in our hearts and minds as we live each day and all that it brings. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
The reading is taken from Romans 12 verses 1 to 8. Romans 12 verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For, as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having the gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to God's word together, shall we pray and ask for God's help? Loving Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, please would you guide us and please would you continue to transform our minds that we would uh, not be conforming to the world's way of thinking, but that we would be changed to be more like the Lord Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Some of you know that I play the trumpet. And I have to say that for a trumpet player, humility is not a quality that comes easily. Because a trumpet, by its very nature, shouts, Hey everybody, look at me. When you play in an orchestra, you sit there often for ages and ages and ages, Sorry for the non-musicians amongst you, but you sit there counting bars rest, counting bars rest, and sometimes it can be a little bit boring. And all the violins and everybody else just gets on and does their thing, and there's hundreds of them. But then suddenly, as a trumpeter, you have your moment, and you suddenly play your few bars, and it rides out over the whole of the orchestra, and it shouts, look at the trumpet, everybody. Look at what I can do. Look, I can, even though there's just one of me, I can be louder than everybody else in the whole orchestra. (laughs) And it's not easy always to be humble. However, as a trumpeter, there are many, many humbling moments as you get your moment, as you launch into your few bars to ride over the whole orchestra and then you completely fluff it or split a note. And everybody, instead of goes, hey, look at him, look at the trumpet, goes, what has he just done? Everybody hears your mistake. Everybody hears the mess that you've made of it. And actually, sometimes when we put ourselves on a pedestal, which is so easy to do, even if we're just doing it within our mind, it can also be very easy to fall from that pedestal and to realise our failings and our sinfulness. And in this one verse that we're going to look at today, Paul is calling people, calling the believers, to look at themselves and to look at themselves realistically. Now you remember last week, we remembered that uh, Paul was calling believers to be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That we're to give everything that we are to God. And as that we do that, our minds were to be renewed and transformed and that we weren't to be conformed to be like the rest of the world around us. 
And as we do that, um, Paul goes on to say that transforming work, that living sacrifice, actually that can only happen within the context of the church community with the support and encouragement of gi and gifts of people around you in the church community. And so that's um, what we're going to be looking at in the next few weeks, in the next few verses of Romans chapter 12. But, but today in this one verse that we're looking at, Paul looks at a particular quality that we need in order to do that, in order to practice that within the church community. And that's the gift of humility. Now, the first thing Paul does is something which appears to be not very humble. Let's look down at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. See, Paul there, he's speaking with authority. He's, he's, he's going off the back of all that he said already, but he's saying, look, I'm an apostle I'm one of those specially chosen by Jesus, so therefore you need to listen to me. Now, at first glance, that doesn't seem particularly humble, does it? Anybody who says, hey, I've got authority, listen to me, we immediately question them. We, we say, well, hang on, uh, what is that authority? Why, why should we listen to you? But did you notice there are a couple of words there that Paul says? For by the grace given to me, you see, Paul realises that his authority is only given to him because of the grace of God at work in his life. Think back on Paul's life. Paul was one of the worst persecutors of Christians. He was the one causing others to kill Christians and to hunt down Christians. Paul was somebody who, if you looked at him, You'd have said, there's no way he's going to become a Christian. He is so opposed to God. He is so opposed to the Lord Jesus and everything that the gospel stands for. And yet we know um, that God wonderfully called Paul and called him to be one of his greatest servants. And as Paul speaks to the people in Rome, in his own heart and his own mind, he's very aware of that. That's why he says, it's not by my ability, my authority, my greatness that I'm saying these things to you. I'm saying these to you, to you recognising and remembering the incredible grace of God at work in my life and the fact that I don't deserve God's grace and mercy any more than the rest of you do. In fact, Paul realises that he probably deserves it even less than anybody else. He didn't deserve anything at all, Paul recognises. He deserved what actually we all deserve, which is judgment and rejection by God. But by God's undeserved kindness, his grace, Paul was called to ministry. Now it's easy, isn't it, to look down on other people. So easy to do that. Maybe you catch yourself doing it as a parent, as you look at other parents and think, oh, I wouldn't have made that, that decision or I wouldn't do that. Or you have a conversation and you subtly drop things into the conversation to kind of show you think they shouldn't be doing that with their kids. Or maybe in the workplace, or maybe we look down on other people because of their use of money and we, we make judgments and assumptions on, on how they're using their money and think, oh, that's not right, we shouldn't be doing that. Maybe we think about how people serve at church and, and we look down on people because we think, oh, I do loads in church and look at all those people and they don't seem to be doing anything very much and yet we don't really know what's going on in everybody's lives or we don't often know really what people are doing to serve in church. It's so easy to put ourselves on that pedestal like I sometimes did as a trumpeter and yet so easy to forget that we can fall off that pedestal in a flash, in the flash of a, a split note or a botched, um, botched phrase. Sometimes we put ourselves on a pedestal, maybe just in our minds. And what that is, it's our pride. 
we're not showing the humility that we're called to. And we're not remembering that actually, just like Paul remembers, we're saved by God's grace. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's the gift of God, as Paul writes elsewhere. We're given God's amazing gift. So, uh, like Paul, with the work of God's grace in our lives, in mind, let's look at what he says. Paul says, I have something that you need to hear. And it's a message for everyone. So as the believers try to live out Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, Paul says that he's given gifts to everyone in the church. Now, we link it on to, these, to the next few verses of uh, Romans chapter 12 that we're going to look at in the next few weeks. But uh, let me remind you again, in verse 3 it says, For by the grace given me, I say to everyone among you. And that everyone among you kind of implies and links to the, to the gifts that Paul talks about in the next few verses. See, when we're good at something, or when we have gifts, we can have a real danger of being arrogant or proud or even becoming self-reliant. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched the, I think it's the first Spider-Man movie. And as the main character in the Sp- Spider-Man movie, I've completely forgotten his name, but uh, he get, he, the story is he gets bitten by this this radioactive spider and then suddenly he develops superpowers and and somebody says to him as he discovers all of his superpowers he says with great power comes great responsibility it's a a classic superhero phrase with great power comes great responsibility and i want to paraphrase that quite a lot really and i think it should be this for the christian we should hear With God's great gifts, we need great humility. With God's great gifts, we need great humility. Because as I say, the Bible tells us that God has given gifts to people in the church and some people are incredibly gifted. Some of those gifts are really obvious when it's maybe upfront stuff, whether it's, um, I don't know, communication or uh, leading or music or drama or that sort of thing. Some of those gifts are less obvious and more behind the scenes. But the danger is, whatever our gifts, is we want to be recognised and we want to be appreciated. We want everybody to look at us and say, hey look at that that person, aren't they amazing at that? Haven't they got fantastic gifts? Even if we know in our minds we should be humble, even if we know in our minds that's the kind of godly thing to do, I'm guessing, unless it's just me, um, that actually in our minds we, we still fall into that trap. Maybe it's that we have really good minds, uh, we've, we've got, we're able to think things through really well and, and we want to be right all the time or we want to win the argument. But you see, those things are the ways of being conformed to the worldly ways of thinking. It's not the godly, mind-transforming way of thinking. God has given everyone in the, gifts, uh, in the church gifts, but we need renewed minds that save us from that self-centred way of thinking that the world encourages, that trumpeter's way of thinking that says, hey, let me do my thing and everybody look at me. Instead, Paul says, we need to look at ourselves realistically. So we've seen that verse 3 is a message of grace. It's a message for everyone. And it's a message of honest evaluation. I don't know about you, but don't you hate it when maybe you get to the end of a course or a conference and you get handed the evaluation sheet, that dreaded evaluation sheet. Or maybe you have to write a CV or give an interview and uh, on the CV or in the interview somebody says tell us what your strengths are, tell us what you're really good at. Or maybe you have to 
uh, write a review of your piece of work for school and they ask you to evaluate your performance. I don't know about you, but often I think, oh, how, how do I fill that in? Because I don't want to come across as arrogant or proud or how do I respond in that CV or that interview? Because I don't want people to think I'm arrogant or proud, but we think, you know, I, I want people to think I've done well, but not too well, because I don't want to come out as, as arrogant. Even if that in our minds, we're thinking, oh, actually, yeah, I'm really brilliant at that. Actually, I'm fantastic at that. But Paul says in this verse 3, and he's got a lot to say to us in verse 3, hasn't he? Paul says we need to think of ourselves with sober judgment. Let me read it again. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Paul says that believers need to make an honest evaluation of themselves. That means not thinking too highly of ourselves, but equally that means not thinking too badly of ourselves. We need to assess ourselves realistically. That's not what the world around us tells us to do. We're not to make ourselves out to be better than we are or to make ourselves out to be someone that we're not. One writer says this, we need to think of, we think of ourselves more highly than we ought and so conclude that we do not need the help of others. You see, if we think we're brilliant at stuff, as that writer says, then that means we become self-reliant. And that's not the way the church works. No, God's given, as we've said already, gifts within the church to help us because we need help as we're transformed, as we live our lives for God. Well, we need to pray and we need to ask God to show us if we need to change our heart and our mind in this area. We need to ask God to help us to do an honest evaluation of ourselves. To go, actually, has God given me gifts that I really need to use, but I'm not using? Or, actually, do I think too much of myself? And am I t trying to put myself forward too much? Uh, and actually, am I being a bit proud about the gifts that God has wonderfully given me? Or maybe... Do I find it really easy to point out the faults in others but not let God work on my own heart? Actually we need to hear that message that we need to make that self-evaluation through prayer, maybe through chatting with a trusted Christian friend. But ultimately it's before God because it's going to be very personal to each one of us. The final thing that Paul has to say in this small but packed little verse is that it's a message of faith. Again, let me read verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You see, as motivation for our humility, Paul is asking the believers to look at their faith in the Lord Jesus. You see, just like all of the other things that we have are gifts from God, so our faith that we have in Jesus is a gift from God. It's not something we can sort of do in our own strength. It's something that God enables in us, us to have that faith. Um, John Piper, a well-known preacher, says this, The last bastion of pride is the belief that we are the originators of our faith. You see, to, to say that faith is all down to us and our work, John Piper rightly says, actually, no, that, that's pride, that's not humility. Our faith is, is a humble recognition of all that God has done for us and a humble recognition that without God at work by his spirit in our lives we would know nothing we'd be able to not know God we wouldn't be able to do anything 
Another writer says this, Paul is asking us to look carefully to the gospel of faith and its requirements as we assess ourselves. There's nothing that we can do for ourselves. We like to think as a human race how brilliant we are, how able we are. We like to think that we can get on without God. We like to think that we can live life without God, without reference to God. Uh, and actually, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, people are bigging up our abilities and how fantastic we are at trying to problem solve and all the rest of it and yes we are but all of those abilities all of the incredible things that the scientists are doing the medical professions are doing they're all doing it because they're gifted it from God as Paul encourages us in Romans 12 verse 3 to humility we've seen that it's a message of grace we've seen that it's a message for everyone We've seen it's a message of honest evaluation and that it's a message of faith. But how can we develop humility in our lives? Because after all, uh, the moment we start to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm very humble, I'm really good at being humble. That's not the actions or words of a humble person, is it? Here's a few ideas. There's many more, but here's a few pointers and ideas. First of all, remember Jesus. Jesus humbled himself to death upon the cross. Jesus was the king of all kings. Jesus is the creator of the universe. Jesus, at a word, created everything that we have in our universe. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, could have clicked his fingers or said a word and he could have come off the cross and freed himself. But no, as Jesus hung on the cross, he was humiliated. He was brought low. He was killed as the worst type of criminal. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, showed total humility because he did that for you and for me so that we could be saved. So first point of call, when we're looking to try and how we can apply this verse, it's look to Jesus. And as we look to Jesus, we need to realise and be able to be real with ourselves and real with others about our failings and about our weaknesses. We need to be willing to realise that we can't do it all on our own. We need to be willing to put others first and think of others first. Be willing to do those jobs and those things that nobody else wants to do. I remember at a church that I once worked at, it was a very large church, sort of seven or eight hundred in the congregation, 20 members of staff uh, on the team. And when we had kind of big events and all of that kind of stuff, when uh, we had big meals as a staff team, you could guarantee when there was washing up needed to do, my boss, the vicar of that church, was the first one at the sink. He could have been there being uh, the guy in charge and making sure everybody uh, saw him, but he was humbly serving. We also need to be willing to lose an argument and not always be right or think we know the answer. And we need to stop ourselves looking at others and finding fault. There's many other things that we could do and say, and there's some great stuff written out there, but all of those things are really hard, aren't they? So we need to pray for ourselves and we need to pray for each other. Think of the difference in our families, in our workplaces, in our church meetings, if we put Romans chapter 12 verse 3 into practice a bit more. For by the grace given to me I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
Shall we pray? Father God, please would you transform our hearts and our minds. Please would you renew our minds so that we are better able to serve you in your wonderful church. Lord, please forgive us for our pride and for our arrogance. Please forgive us for the times when we look down on others and yet forget to look at ourselves. Please would you transform us and give us an attitude of humility. Help us to think of ourselves and evaluate ourselves realistically with your eyes that we might be able to use the gifts that you've given us for the growth of your church and the strengthening and building of your kingdom. We pray that all of this would be for your wonderful glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing
Let's pray, shall we? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us this morning. I trust that you have uh, enjoyed this hour or so and that you have been blessed as a result. Don't forget to put those Keswick Convention dates in your diary. It's the 27th to the 31st of July and uh, plan to enjoy a lot of the uh, things that they have to offer along with uh, many of us at St Botolph's.